I think it's fair to say, you know, you're, you might not be the most known of the candidates. So I think part of what this is, is trying to help people get to know you. Scott, um, nice to meet you all. Say hi, Scott. <laughs> Sounds like an AA meeting. Great. As this campaign began, I think it's probably safe to say that nobody knew me outside of Perry Sound, Muskoka, but that's changing rapidly. So uh, you might not be that well known, but you do have a long history in local politics and it's often said, but seldom understood, that local politics is where things actually happen. It actually affects people's lives the most. But you've been on council a long time. You've been the mayor of Huntsville. Um, you've made the trek out here to Calgary to make the case for getting the support of Western conservatives. What is it that you are offering Western voters that none of the other candidates are right now? In, in, in a short sentence, it's a years and years of experience of getting things done, solving problems, fixing things, actually focused on changing things for the better for people without any Ottawa baggage. Ottawa is, uh, is a broken place. John made that point very well, I think, that uh, the partisan political rancor that goes on there uh, is disgusting. And it was probably one of the first things I noticed when I got there that I, I just simply could not believe the penchant for, you know, just the, the next great line that'll play well on your Twitter feed versus actually solving problems and, and focusing on, on getting things done for Canadians. And so I, I, I think Canada's ready for some small town mayor who actually focuses on doing things. Things like the housing crisis that exists in our country. It's everywhere. These liberals have promised billions and billions and billions of dollars literally over the last seven years and have not solved the problem. They haven't moved the needle. The CMHC has made that very clear. They haven't moved the needle. They've well, never got anything done. I appreciate that, but my question is more uh, geared to the West specifically. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a big country, it's very diverse, and uh, we hardly agree on what the time of day is sometimes. <laughs> um, but it's the Western standard debate. We're, trying to fo we're, okay. we're, we're holding this because we want to focus on, on Western issues. And obviously, these things have national residence. Right. National issues are often Western issues. Western issues are national issues. But speaking more to Western issues, and you can define that broadly, but what is it you're offering to Westerners, kind of addressing some of the concerns that are maybe more acute here to Albertans, Saskatchewans, I always have trouble calling them, uh, British Columbians. Right. You want to address you know, their more specific concerns. What is it you're offering that others aren't? Yeah, I, I, I think that that's part of, I guess, what I offer is that I'm, is that I'm not an Ottawa-centric guy. I, I'm actually just a small town mayor. One of the first things I did when I became a federal member of parliament is the first trip I was able to do, keeping in mind that COVID had started, as I, as I came to Calgary. I came to visit uh, my colleague, Tom Kamich, came to visit Greg McLean, and I wanted to you know, visit and uh, learn more about what's going on here. And I was surprised uh, and dismayed, I guess, at the number of people that said, sorry, you're from Ontario? And what, what are you doing here? You know, they just didn't get it. They said, people in Ontario don't care about us. Uh, and that's fundamentally what I think we need to change. I do care very much about what goes on here in Alberta. Uh, Alberta is the economic engine of our country. Uh, and I think Albertans are tired of feeling used. And that's the kind of, that's the kind of leadership that I bring. I'll be here. And in, in making sure that I run an inclusive, engaged, uh, and, and involved government that includes all parts of the country, especially the West. So let's talk about that specifically. Um, equalization is a huge issue in Alberta, and it's increasingly an issue in British Columbia and Saskatchewan, maybe less so in Manitoba. Um, maybe I've missed it, but I, I haven't heard you make any proposals around equalization. Forgive me if I have missed it. Mm -hmm. um, Alberta held a referendum last fall to abolish equalization from the Constitution. Uh, it was a pretty resounding majority, uh, despite some problems with the government at the time. How, would, how do you respond from the demand of a large majority of Albertans to abolish equalization? You're in the prime minister's chair. How, how are you responding? To yeah, that? I think, I think it's I think it'd be tough to abolish equalization. It's one of the founding principles of why we why the provinces got together and created this federal government in the first place. Well, actually, I believe it was added to the constitution in the 1930s. The I don't 30s. mean to be pedantic, but it, but it, it wasn't but always in, there. But in fact an equalization formula started almost instantly. One of the reasons the provinces came together to create this federal government was to help, frankly, with, with some of the issues related to debt. The, the federal government was born with 75 million of the $80 million worth of debt that the colonies, the provinces had. It was, it was created in part to help 
you know, ease the burden and spread some of the wealth. So it exists. But the problem is, of course, is you've got generation after generation of federal governments and politicians that are constantly trying to buy votes in different parts of the country. And they use the equalization formula and they play around with it. And it's been changed over and over and over again to buy votes where they want to buy the votes. And this is, frankly, the problem with our federalism. John spoke to it, I think, very well about the fact that the provinces actually run this country. They do. And it was designed that way. I think it's time for us to get back to how the founders actually envisioned this country in the first place. And so I, I say, yes, we need to meet with all the premiers, but we need, we, need to, we need to take a look at that equalization formula and bring it back into, uh, into you know, how it was envisioned initially. No more special deals. This is one area where I actually disagree with my friend Jean Charest. I, I, it's time for the special deals is over. No more special deals for Quebec. Albertans don't want a special deal. They just want a fair deal that everybody gets the same deal. That's what I fight for. All right. I, I think, uh, I know I'm paraphrasing, but I, Ernest Manning, um, who was the premier of uh, Alberta for many, many years with the social credit, uh, hey, we got a fresh water for you. Um, he, <laughs> a big um, one too. You know, he was around when they were putting the, the, uh, the equalization formula together. And I, I recall he said something along the lines of, uh, the premiers were told, just said, here's how much we want. Ottawa, just go find a formula to make it happen. And it's, and it's been a very Byzantine formula yeah. the entire time. I yeah, think it doesn't make any sense. Probably less me. than, uh, even those of us who think we understand it, probably don't entirely. It's, yeah. it's quite complicated. Um, your campaign is really focused on trying to unite conservatives and have a, maybe a more civil discussion. Um, but in trying to be the nice guy, your campaign maybe carries a risk of being the Switzerland candidate, caught between the big guys, trying to bring everyone to peace. Um, and, and that maybe carries the risk of maybe being lost in, in the noise uh, between maybe the different kind of polar opposites uh, right. with, within the campaign. How do you stand out from the other candidates on the big issues that have largely defined this campaign? I, I think the fact that I've actually focused on the issues very specifically. I think some of the other campaigns have have, uh, you know, focused on each other, and I've focused on issues very specifically and come up with specific ideas to solve those problems, whether it's the housing crisis, I've come up with very specific policy proposals. I actually understand it pretty well, having done the real estate business and been a municipal politician, I know it well. I've come up with some very specific policy proposals on uh, addressing some of the sacred cows that exist in our system, like supply management. I think it's oh, time for I got us to, a question on that to move you. away from that system. It's my favorite. Uh, it's time for us to move away from that system. I think it's going to be chipped away at every new trade deal we do. And it's time for us to actually be honest with ourselves and say we need to create new markets, which again is another one of the reasons we created this federal government, to create new markets for our world-class dairy products around the world and create some competition be because we have to make food more affordable for Canadians. It's getting tougher and tougher to feed our families. Inflation's out of control. So I'm, I'm putting together this very specific policy proposal. I'm not talking about the other candidates. I'm talking about ideas that actually are solutions to problems. Okay, well, I, I had that as uh, my last question if we had time. We're going to go straight to that one okay. now. Uh, those who know me know that it's, it's a real... It, it might not be the biggest, the biggest, most pressing political issue in Canada, but I think it's, it's difficult for conservatives mm -hmm. to look someone in the eye and say, I believe in free enterprise except for this entire section of the economy that should be run along Soviet lines. <laughs> um, but it's obviously fraught with political risk. It's obviously had impact on previous conservative leadership yeah. campaigns. Um, I think this issue, unless I'm missing something from the other candidates, I think you're, you perhaps stand alone. Uh, maybe we missed something with Roman before. Roman, I think, is, yeah, Roman, I think is actually well. mentioned on the yeah. Cory Morgan show as well. Why do you believe uh, the conservatives have to, to get around this issue, supply management in particular, because it, it, is, an, it is probably the most powerful lobby in Canada. It, it is extremely able to, it, it can exert its influence on the pressure points in Canadian politics. Yeah. And, uh, it, and you're obviously, um, you're, you're playing with fire doing it, but I think it's, it's, it's clearly something that needs to be addressed. Why, why do you think conservatives need to address it? Well, I think individual Canadians' voices should matter more than the lobbyists, for starters, and that needs to change. But I think this, this is one of those issues that it's, it's as I call it, a sacred cow. Um, but it is because of the lobbyists. And it is because, uh, you know, th they've created this system that provides stability. I understand that. Provides security. And they like that. There's no question about that. Uh, but I, I haven't tried to demonize farmers either. I think our farmers have done an amazing job of, of, of creating a system where they produce literally world-class products uh, within a system that is flawed. 
Uh, and I'm not suggesting for a second we throw farmers to the, to the wolves either. I'm thinking we need to transition away. We need to create new markets and we need to, we need to do it in a, in a rational, responsible way. And it won't be cheap, but it's something that we have to do because I think that it's, it's also important to introduce competition into the market as well. Because frankly, the, I think the biggest issue that Canadians face across this country right now is an affordability crisis and we need to make food cheaper. Uh as I was talking about with Mr. Charest, uh, you know, from 2020 to 2022, we've had a long series of lockdowns from the provinces, mandates federally and provincially. It is hugely divided Canadians, but it is especially divided conservatives. It right. has been, uh, you know, left-leaning parties have generally not had the kind of party discipline issues and unity issues. The parties on the center right and the right have, um, you know, because it's been framed uh, by many, and I have to admit, me too, as very much an author, a lot of authoritarianism coming in. And so it divides conservatives, sometimes along traditional conservative and libertarian lines. Um, you, you know, you, you've portrayed yourself as someone able to, to unite conservatives and find compromise that, you know, comes from experience in municipal politics. But this issue is probably a little less maybe prone to compromise. One side uh, sees the other as, uh, you know, maybe racist, sexist, anti-science and selfish, and the other side sees the other as heartless, cold, authoritarian. And so there's, there doesn't seem to be a lot of room for compromise on something that has become so incredibly polarizing. Uh, do you believe you'd be able to find a satisfactory compromise on this kind of issue that would be able to keep conservatives together where perhaps Aaron O'Toole and Jason Kenney could yeah. not? Yeah, and I think, and this is where it, this is where it has to begin. And, and this is part of the problem with our politics overall for several generations now. Uh, but the, I think one of the reasons why this became such a difficult issue is because Justin Trudeau turned it into an issue that way. He chose to demonize Canadians who chose not to get vaccinated to try to win votes with those who are vaccinated. That's disgusting. It should never have happened. But that's how our politics works in this country. We seek to capitalize uh, as politicians on the differences of opinion that exist, whether it's East versus West, urban versus rural, vaccinated versus unvaccinated, uh, and, and demonize people. So uh, to me, that's, that's something that should never have happened. It's something that I would never operate as a prime minister. I believe that it's time to start calling this country together, all the things that do unite us. The other issue here too, though, uh, is that when it, when it came to this issue, I think Mr. Shrey spoke about this very well also. Nobody had a playbook. We didn't really know what we were facing. Um, and I think it's important for us to remember that um, freedom is absolutely fundamental to our society. But with freedom comes responsibility. And so in my mind, thank you, I, what I said about, about COVID all along has been this. I trust my doctor. I trusted him when he told me I needed to have surgery. I trusted him when he said, you need to get this vaccination. Okay. But I also respect the rights of other Canadians to choose their medical choices. That is a fundamental right as well. And so I also believe, and trust me, I hated wearing a mask. And I am just as frustrated as Mr. Chiray getting on a plane and not playing. I complain about Justin Trudeau quite vigorously on the plane when I do it. But if I have to wear a mask a little bit longer to respect your choice not to get a vaccination, then I'm prepared to do that. And I think we should all be prepared to do that, to respect your choice and make sure that we get through something like a pandemic that we don't entirely understand uh, and make sure that we get through it. Mr. Shree also made the very good point about our healthcare system. And this is another one of those areas of federal responsibility where we created a system in the 60s predicated on a promise where the federal government will pay 50% of the cost and we promptly never lived up to that promise. We have a broken healthcare system and we wear it as this badge of honor like we have the best system in the world and it simply is not. And the federal government needs to stop meddling in provincial affairs promising to pay 50% of the costs and get back to the job that it was created for in the first place, like creating new markets for our dairy products, like focusing on spending 2% so of GDP. I'm gonna follow your first, side. Yeah. Yeah. I wanna follow your sidewinder here um, and onto healthcare here. Uh, would, you be, uh, you know, would you be willing to amend the Canada Health Act to allow private delivery of services uh, yeah. with or without uh, uh, the single payer system? Uh, absolutely, 1000%, that needs to happen. We, in fact, we need, to, we need to drive more private delivery of services into the single-payer system to, to create those efficiencies. Ontario did a reasonably good job 
uh, of creating some, some efficiencies within their system through their funding formula that drives, basically the funding formula is, is driven by volume. And so that's driven some efficiencies into the system. But we need more of that and we need more private care. Uh, and, and frankly, the federal government needs to pony up its share of what it promised to share in the first place, which is never done. And so if we did that, then the provinces wouldn't, wouldn't be facing fiscal unsustainability either. So it needs to be reopened. Uh, and the federal government needs to come to the table with its, with its, with its promised share uh, to make sure that we have a system that doesn't have to be locked down to save it uh, like we did through this COVID-19 business. So uh, right now, the boundaries of the seats in the House of Commons are being redrawn and redistributed based on population changes. The Bloc Québécois put forward a motion that would override the uh, legislative formula uh, that would give Quebec an extra seat uh, that its shrinking population does not warrant this comes at the direct expense of provinces that are growing in population like British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan. Yeah. All of the parties, uh, except for the Conservatives, voted pretty much all for this. The Conservatives, however, were divided. Uh, I did a little research on this. I think you voted against it. I was one of the few that voted against it. Absolutely. I want you to maybe explain why, why you did that, because the Conservatives were divided yeah. pretty sharply along those lines. Um, why did you vote against that? Uh, obviously, it's going to be a popular vote to, to vote against that yeah. here in Alberta, it's, it's but a, tell another, us about it. It's another example of special deals for different, different regions of the country. Either we believe in rep population re representation by population, or we don't. I believe in representation by population. I used to have this argument when I was the mayor of Huntsville in Muskoka. It's a region of lakes and really, you know, very ex outrageously expensive cottages that exist on waterfront properties. And the, the townships always felt like they paid the biggest freight. And so they should have more votes. And I said, well, that's representation by wealth. I don't agree with that either. Representation by population, full stop. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'm after that softball, I'm going to give you a little little tougher here. Okay. Uh, Canada's not run a balanced budget since 2008. Under both liberal and conservative uh, governments, we've run a long stream of deficits. They're now just much larger, wildly out of control. The last election, however, uh, the Conservative Party under Aaron O'Toole did not run on a balanced budget. Uh, they paid some kind of lip service to it, but there was nothing even vaguely representing a credible plan to return to balanced budget in any kind of realistic yeah. time frame. As Prime Minister, would you balance the budget within your first term? And if so, what are the, the key, key uh, action items you would take to get there? Uh, the, the answer is a guarded yes. I think it's absolutely possible. I think it's possible. To, it would be possible to balance it now. The economy is firing on all cylinders, and yet this Liberal government borrowed another, you know, 50 billion because they think they need to stimulate the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it, it probably could be it could be balanced within that first mandate based on what's going on in this country. Um, it, there's, there's no question that, that this, this government, this, this current liberal government has borrowed way too much money. And, but it's also important to acknowledge that there's good, there's good debt and bad debt. If we're, if we're borrowing to invest to grow the economy, that's, that's one thing. Uh, but this government just spends recklessly and continues to grow the federal public service with reckless abandon. And, and, and honestly, we need some smart fiscal managers to rein in the spending and focus on the resp core responsibilities the federal government was created for. Now, I, the economy is firing pretty hot right now, but I, the deficits are so massive that it's unlikely that economic growth alone is going to get us there. I, yeah. I, I think it's fair to say uh, there's going to need to be, perhaps even beyond spending restraints, some spending cuts because spending we're spending more now we're boring more now than we have it, even at the highest point of the Second World War or the First World War. It's, it's at record levels. Uh, are you prepared to cut spending if necessary to get there? And, and, and if so, what are some of the significant items uh, that you would put on the block? Well, I, I think in, a, in what is now an over $400 billion budget, there's lots of room to trim, not cut. Uh, to to rein spending in, and I this would is Calgary. We want cut. Yeah, well, I get that. Yeah. Um, I and I, but I couldn't tell you what I would I would cut, other than I would say we need to trim in a lot of areas. The, the the Liberal government has grown the federal civil service outrageously so, and we need to rein that in. There's no need to have uh, the bureaucracies we have. And again, I come back to this issue of if we were to live up to the original promise on our healthcare spending. Um, we could we could get out of an awful lot of other businesses that we meddle in the provincial responsibilities now, and we wouldn't need bureaucracies to, to you know, to 
try to manage what we're trying to do in provincial jurisdiction. Think about how many, think about how many bureaucrats there are between the provinces and the federal government to determine how much money the federal government is giving the province, whether the province got enough money, and whether this was done right, so they have to go back to the bureaucrat bureaucracy here for this, and back and forth, back and forth. The fact is, bureaucracies giving money back and forth to each other costs us billions. Let's just stop that. I want, I want to make sure I understand something you said. Are, are you proposing that the federal, uh, the original Canada Health Act and the agreement with the provinces was 50-50? Uh, we're obviously nowhere near that. But for Ottawa to meet that obligation, which it was supposed to from the 60s, mm -hmm. Pearson, uh, that would be a massive increase in federal spending. It, if I understand you correctly, were you saying that the federal government should be paying 50-50? And I think that would be part of the discussion. Absolutely. I, I, and I think that if we did that, then the provinces could afford to deliver all the other services that we meddle in now. We could get out of all those other businesses. Right now, there's no reason for the federal government to be involved, you know, you know, funding over here for this social program, funding for that, funding for education. We fund all these different little areas, uh, and it's a constant fight about how much we give. If we, if we focused on the original promise and re renegotiated the Canada Health Act, uh, and we, we could eliminate huge swaths of a federal bureaucracy meddling in provincial affairs. So I want to talk, kind of bring it back to more specifically Western issues right now. Um, Alberta last uh, fall, in addition to the equalization referendum, uh, we had municipal elections and a Senate election. Every once in a while, the rest of Canada kind of cocks its head sideways and says, what the heck is that? Uh, we had a Senate election. And uh, to the surprise of everyone, three conservatives won. Um, <laughs> now, it's been the longstanding policy of conservative prime ministers going back to at least the later part of Brian Mulroney when we were in the kind of the middle of Meech Lake and Charlottetown, that they would appoint provincially elected uh, senators or senators in waiting, if you uh, call them what you will. Um, my question is two part. One is, would you honor that if you're prime minister, would you elect, would you appoint elected Alberta conservatives to the Senate? Uh, and, and second, and I know this is a bit of a Pandora's box here, would you entertain the idea of more fundamental Senate reform? Uh, right now, Alberta, with a population of greater than all four Atlantic provinces combined, has less seats than just New Brunswick or just Nova Scotia. It's, it's quite the opposite of representation by population. Mm. It's like the inverse of how much money you pay is the seats you get. It's a, it doesn't really make much sense. It's almost medieval. But I, I understand that's a yeah. constitutional Pandora's box. So Two, two, two parts of that question. It, it is. I, I, I'd be inclined to honor the, uh, you know, the, the elections. Um, I haven't given it a lot of thought because it is a quagmire. Uh, and I think you know, Stephen Harper tried his level best to reform it and really didn't get very far with it. Um, and so you know, I, constitutional discussions in this country are difficult. And Mr. Chere has <laughs> got the scars on his back to prove it. By the time I, I was going to ask him that one too. <laughs> Um, and so I, it is a difficult thing. I, I, I think that uh, I, would, I would focus more on uh, you know, fixing the things that you can fix as opposed to tackling you know, issues like that that you know, take you down a rabbit hole and you don't ever get so, solved. So major center reform would be more or less off the table, which, which is, I think, a fairly standard position because it is yeah. quagmire. But appointing elected senators uh, to the Senate, that, that is something Yeah, I'd do. be inclined to support that. Yeah. All right. Um, is there anything else you want to leave us with before, uh, before we're done? You, you, you're actually so good at answering questions, I, uh, I didn't have to bring you back to it. My campaign team is, tells me, stop answering questions. Focus on your own issues. I, I, yeah. Well, no, I don't really have anything else to say other than, I've, listen, I've really enjoyed this very much. I appreciate the opportunity. I've enjoyed getting to know my fellow candidates better. I've been, enjoyed getting to know Canadians and conservatives across the country better. And uh, I'm proud of what we're doing. And, uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to continuing right through till September the 10th. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, thank and uh, good luck on the campaign trail. Thanks. Appreciate it. I'll take that with me.